everyone this is Ben and uh, I want to come to you today with a video with some stuff I've learned about sort of the history of Christian apologetics and more importantly not the more ancient history but more of the stuff that has got us to the situation churches are in today so it's I've been doing some reading and learning some things and one of the things I learned that was very interesting and, and a lot of new information was like, how do we get into the situation where when you do apologetics in churches today, there seems to be some, some opposition. And uh, I haven't made a video in a while because I've had some stuff I'm working on that I wanted to get just right. And so I've sort of got... I've got a, a morality video that I'm working on the script for and I kind of want to like put it down and then come back to it to see if I can tweak it and when you put it down for a while you notice things that you missed before and then also I was wor I've been working a lot with uh, historical evidence and that sort of thing trying to tighten that up as much as possible but the more I delved into that the more I've been realizing that like I need to learn more about this and and so, I can heartily agree with William Lane Craig that, like, if you think that historical apologetics is the easy route and you can just avoid philosophical arguments for God, you're wrong. Like, historical apologetics are very challenging and difficult, too. So, don't, don't write them off as, like, the easy way. Um... So, yeah, I've been working with that quite a bit, uh, learned some new stuff, and I'm at a point now where I'm, I'm not very happy with a lot of what's out there on either side. So, I'm, I, I'm not super delighted with what the Christians are, are giving me, but I'm not super delighted with, uh, the atheists seem ridiculous too. Um, and so I'm going to have to like really take a look back at it. And so I might have to put that one on hold, but I kept, you know, thinking, I was like, I'm going to make this video. And it's like, well, maybe not yet. And then it's like, finally dawned on me. It's like, I don't know if this is going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> so on the flip side, I thought, you know, what would be interesting, you know, to do a video for right now would be, let's take a look at some stuff that I've learned. I got a book. I think uh, William Lane Craig's Reasonable Faith. It's it's like one of his big books, um, and he actually gives you some history of Christian apologetics. And so I thought that would be fun to take a look at because it's it's what what you find that is that like it's super relevant, and you can see sort of the genesis and the origin of ideas that are essentially very normal today and, and, and taught in all the churches and you wonder like there are a lot of ideas that are commonly taught in churches that are actually from the Bible they come from Germany in the 1800s and so let's just get right into it what you have and basically the 1700s is a period of intellectual thought that's generally called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is a misnomer because it wasn't really all that much. It wasn't the, the people who lived in thought of themselves as living in a time of light and the people who came before them as living in a time of darkness. So they coined Enlightenment and Dark Age. And they, and they saw that, like, in the 1500s with the Italian Renaissance was sort of the beginnings of what eventually worked its way through the 1600s and into the 1700s as the ultimate flowering of knowledge and, and things were finally right, the Enlightenment. And then in the 1800s, you have sort of a rejection of the Enlightenment that comes out of Germany that defines what is very commonly believed today when it comes to religion. If you go back to the what they called the Dark Ages, which weren't really an age of darkness, but the, we, we could say the medieval period, 
in the medieval period, uh, the apologetic question hinged on other things. It's really interesting in and of itself. They were very concerned with apologetics and all that. Um, but they had very different uh, concerns that they were battling with. So we're just going to skip them for now because it, it's too interesting and there's too much there. Um, when you get the Enlightenment, you have anti-religious thinkers like Voltaire, who you know wrote Candide. Um, I can't think of some of the other guys. Gibbons is one of the big names. Um, and it's essentially, as I understand it, the, the Enlightenment is basically a French and English phenomenon, or it seems like all of the uh, thinkers are coming out of that era. That are coming out of that area are, are, are French and English. And as I, and this is actually, this is the period, this is, this is the thinking that gave birth to America. The, it's an enlightenment ideal uh, situation. So, like, America, of course, declared its independence in 1776, you know, right in the middle of the enlightenment and that sort of thing. So, like, the enlightenment thinkers were really impressed with uh, Sir Isaac Newton's uh, physics, or what, what would today we call classical physics, although... That's a little bit confusing because classical usually means Greek and Roman, and Newton's physics certainly contradicted Greek and Roman physics heavily. Newton's physics was the was born out of a, a long, slow process uh, throughout the Middle Ages of scientific advancements, and then you have the the real icing on the cake when Sir Isaac Newton, you know, fits everything together. They still teach. Newton's physics in schools today, even though we've now improved on it, and it's actually not the accurate physics. They could just teach Einstein's physics, um, but it's a little bit harder to wrap your mind around. And, and for the most part, Newton's physics are, are a close enough approximation that kids can just learn Newton's physics. And that's one of the weird things about school. It's like, it doesn't really matter if you ever remember any of this. It's just to prove that you can learn it so that you probably what the thing you actually need to learn at work for whatever job you'll be competent to learn that you know <laughs> um but you probably won't need to know this it's just some generic knowledge we teach you just so you can prove that you can learn things so anyway uh the enlightenment as i can see it there were anti-religious thinkers i think rousseau was anti-religious and they were certainly critical of religion. Uh, Hume, another big name, can't forget David Hume. Um, you've got the first Great Awakening that happened during this time. So you've got, you've got uh, jo uh, is it George Whitfield, but Whitfield, and then John Wesley. You know, big uh, religious revivals that you know happened in I think in England and America. So huge things, huge, huge events going on. Uh, this is like, let's see, the King James Bible was published, I think it's 1611, and so people had had their own printed Bibles for a while, but like, it, it really was becoming commonplace. You know, it had been about 100 years before this that people really had Bibles, and now this was becoming, you know, something that probably had more of an influence on the culture, I would say. For reference, Shakespeare lived during the Elizabethan period, which would basically be the 1500s. So, and of course during, we could go into so much with like the wars and colonial expansion and the effects that this had and how it really cost these countries money um, in the long run. But as far as the intellectual thought... The big, the two biggest schools, as I understand it, were really the Deists and the Christians. And what the Deists said is that God created the universe, and he, you know, as they say, he sort of wound it up like a clock. He designed it, 
And he controls everything that happens, but he controls it from the beginning. And the deists didn't like the idea of the incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They saw miracles as a violation of the laws of nature. You can't alter the laws of nature. And there are problems, you know, scientifically. If, if God can, you know, perform a miracle, then, like, that creates a problem in science because science, scientific knowledge is based on sort of the reliability of nature. That nature is working according to some sort of plan, planned out principles that are set in stone ahead of time, and therefore you you can't just you know if you can just hock up any observation you make in science to well God you know did something different that time, then it becomes pointless to look for the principles and to be able to make predictions and understand how the world works. There is no way it works, just however God feels like at that moment, kind of thing. So that that's a problem. Um. And so the deists, their point of view was they didn't believe in miracles, so they didn't believe in the resurrection or that Jesus performed any miracles. And you can see this with Thomas Jefferson published his own uh, version of the Bible called Jefferson's Bible and had all the miracles cut out. It just had the moral teachings. So as best I can tell, these deists still believed in a first cause, that they're, that they're, so they believed in cosmological arguments, and they believed in moral arguments for God. Um, they believed that God was a moral lawgiver, but they didn't believe in Jesus, and that you had to believe in Jesus for your sins. And I'm, I'm, I'm not just pulling information from William Lake Craig book. I'm pulling it from like all sorts of sources, but from what I actually heard on the radio, I was told that. The deist, the deism of the Enlightenment was not like a God who doesn't care what happens to us. It wasn't like a sort of God who creates the world and then doesn't care. But it was more of like they believe that God created the world and is the moral lawgiver and you need to follow the moral law. And then when you die, you'll be judged and you'll go to like a heaven or hell based on how well you follow the moral law. But they did not like the idea of God becoming incarnated as one of us and and all that all that stuff of the miracles and, and 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 one of the the deists one of the deist claims was that the one of the primary proofs for God's existence was that miracles never happen. To the deists that proved God exists. And so like that meant that the world always functioned according to this prior set plan. And so that proves God's existence. Now, the Christians came back and made all sorts of arguments. Essentially, you get a lot of historical arguments in defense of the resurrection, in defense of the historicity of the resurrection, miracles, and a lot of arguments that would only matter to deists, like, or in that Enlightenment era. So, like, today, no one would care if a miracle was caused by a demon or caused by an angel or caused by a god. But that was a primary part of the debate back then, of the intellectual scholarly debate. Whereas today, we would debate whether or not miracles happen at all, you know, because today the debate is between religion and belief in the supernatural versus, on the other hand, no supernatural, you know, it's all just nature and physical processes. Whereas back then, it was... It was very different. Um, so, you see that Enlightenment thought, and as I understand it, a guy by the name of John Locke became probably the, I think as William Lane Craig uh, explains it, he's probably the most significant religious thinker. And he was a Christian, if I remember right, and he his position was something called theological rationalism. He said you shouldn't believe in anything that you can't prove. And you need to have proof. So like you shouldn't believe in God unless you can prove God. You shouldn't believe in Jesus unless you can prove Jesus. And then he went to offer proof. So John Locke seems to be 
sort of like a Thomas Aquinas for this age. You know, he's like a dominant religious thinker. He's the one that people reference and go back to. And he, you know, so like this, so you can see this idea of theological rationalism pervaded all of the Enlightenment thinkers. You've got the deists and the, and the Christians, and they're all proving, they're all giving evidence and proof for their thing. And then you've got a general argument that they can make that Christians had made for a long time. Even Augustine or Augustine living in 350 AD or basically 400 AD. Uh, getting a little confused. We'll just say 400. Uh, he said this. If you don't have proof for your religion, then how will you know which religion to believe in? You know, Richard Dawkins likes this. He's famous for saying that today. You can Google. Uh, well, it's probably he's probably not famous anymore. But recently, he was famous for saying, you know, like, why should I? Why should you ask me? You know, why I don't believe in Jesus? I could ask you why you don't believe in Thor or the fairy godmother, you know, or Odin. You know, like. Why, or he says, or the juju of the mountain, you know, if you lived in Central Africa, which I think is where he's from. So, like, the thing is, Augustine and and St. Saint, Saint Augustine and Richard Dawkins, Professor Richard Dawkins, have a point that, like, if you don't have proof for your belief, then you're not justified in believing it, and you have no way to tell what to believe in without proof. So why be a Christian versus a Hindu or a Muslim or a Buddhist or believe in the juju of the mountain? And that point would have been more poignant in Augustine's day. In Augustine's day, like, there was a, there was a whole lot of paganism still around. And so Christianity wasn't exactly this dominant only religion in the world. You know, that, that super wasn't the case in Augustine's day. So he was much more aware of the newness of Christianity. It was only a few centuries old, and paganism was still a very prevalent thing, and different pagan beliefs, different cults, different religions. He was in a much he was in a world that had just a wider variety of religious beliefs. Today that doesn't come across a lot of times because like in America it's like the the options people take are um, religious, which means I'm some kind of Christian, or I'm not religious, which means, uh, you know, I'm some sort of skeptic, atheist, agnostic in that world. Um, and there's a few people who, like, take that third route of, like, Eastern. But it's like, they never, they never care, it's, it, you know, they, they never care about distinctions between Hinduism versus Buddhism versus Jainism versus Confucianism versus Taoism. It's all just the East, you know, and so we, we label it like New Age, and it's just like anything Eastern is good, you know, so like I'm Buddhist, you know, like Patrick Duffy or something, <laughs> you know. I'm going to quote Buddha and then, then Hindu... Hindu guys, even though Buddha disagreed with those guys, and so like here in America, we get the differences. Like we take them seriously between like say someone's a Catholic versus this guy over here is a Jew versus this guy over here is you know Baptist, you know. But they're all religious. None of them are atheists. But and you know this guy over here is a Muslim, whereas. The way we in the West view a lot of Eastern religions, we we just we would it's like we're taking Jews and Catholics and Baptists and maybe Muslims too and just lumping them all in the same boat like they're all the same. Um, but like here in America, they tend to be basically someone's religious beliefs are somewhere in that, like they're somewhere on that spectrum of some kind of Christian, some kind of atheist, some kind of New Age, you know. Um, or somewhere in between the on those. So like pe a lot of people just b say like they believe in a higher power. I had a kid, uh, it was like a couple years ago and he was skating with me late one night and he was like amazed that I believed in God. And then I went to church. He's like, you believe in that stuff? And he told me that I was dumb for believing in it and that, you know, persons should just believe in a higher power and that's all. 
And uh, so he wasn't willing to sacrifice religion. And if I was to press the kid, he, his higher power probably wouldn't be like Hindu higher power type thing. It would probably be something more like uh, a god. You know, a, a monotheistic higher power. So, you get the gist of it. And you get the gist of the Enlightenment, guys. So, so what, ha what happened to the Enlightenment? This is interesting. In England, apparently it just sort of fizzled out. It just sort of lost steam. And then, in France, the French Revolution happened, or what's really the Revolution. And in the French Revolution was amazingly atheist. So, as best I understand it, the French Revolution is the first time that atheism got political power. And it was, it was like the first time you had officially atheist governments. So, you had governments that were like actually banning religion and requiring everyone to be atheists, you know, and creating their own churches of atheism and that kind of thing. And, uh, of course, the French Revolution went through different iterations, but in the early revolution, as I understand from reading uh, Rod Rodney Stark's book, uh, I forget which, oh, well, he talks about a lot of his different books, that the first iteration... The first version of the French Revolution was like um, fully atheist, and there was a lot of violence towards religious people. It was like execute the religious people, persecute them. It was, it, I mean, and there was a lot of violence in the French Revolution period. The next sort of iteration in the revolution, you get like they try to keep they they go they go for the deist route. And then, eventually what happens is Napoleon comes to power, and to, to sort of settle the issue, Napoleon brings the Catholic Church in, but he kind of runs it. And so in France, like, uh, he has a lot of control. So, like, the way it works is the French government will force the people to pay a tax, and then that tax will be money that he gives to the Catholic Church in France. But he allowed them to accept the authority of the Pope, which was like an issue that was one of the key issues uh, going into the French Revolution. The di distinction between juring priests and non-juring priests. So, like, in the early days of the Revolution, uh, they demanded that, that... So, before the Revolution, the Church had a tithe that people, everyone, it didn't matter what social class you were in, you had to pay 10% of your money to the church. And the Catholic Church was under criticism, and they actually willingly gave up the tithe to maintain peace and stability, but this did not, this wasn't enough for, you know, and they said, you've got to deny the, the Pope, and that, that, you know, that a lot of priests wouldn't do that, and they eventually got to the point where they were just, you know, just straight murdering people and, and setting up, you know, atheist churches. And they seized all church property and, and, and that sort of thing. So, that's what happened in France. Germany sort of missed the whole Enlightenment thing. They didn't miss the Protestant Reformation, of course. So, Germany kind of wakes up in the 1800s. And they see the Enlightenment, and they sort of rebel against it intellectually and come back in the other way. And as I can understand it, there were three big ideas that come out of this. And these ideas are, this is where things get very familiar. So, one of the ideas was I guess we could call liberal religion and and that was essentially like you know you have people in the Church of England who'll say that like yeah I don't believe Jonah was swallowed by the whale and I don't you know like 
I don't believe in a global flood or that Noah really existed. He's just a metaphor, and Adam and Eve didn't really exist. They're just a metaphor. But I do believe in Jesus, that he died for our sins, that he really did exist and die for our sins. Or you might have like really liberal, liberal ones who say, yeah, Jesus doesn't even exist. But it's like we're still religious. We still are call ourselves Christian, but you can believe parts of it and not. And you know, you have you have liberty in what you believe within your religion. So this is where Barack Obama, you know, he's a liberal Christian as he proclaimed himself, and he's, you know, he said. This is one of the things that like helped him get elected, you know. He said he was uh, before Congress talking about abortion. This is before he was elected the first time and he said that uh all of the laws in the United States are based on their he he called them the codification of Judeo-Christian principles. Which codification just means codification just means like it's you take a general concept and then you figure out a more specific way of life based on it. So that's what Confucius did with with uh, Taoism. Taoism is a basic concept, but then Confucius figured out he codified Taoism into actual culture and way of life and rules for living. And so instead of just one general purpose, you have specific you know ethics. And so, you know, Obama was like admitting this and it was like pretty cool to have, you know, someone on the liberal side actually admit that, you know, we're like, wow, and that's a pretty Christian thing to say that like all of our laws are the codification of Judeo-Christian principles. I think he was talking about gay marriage. It wasn't the abortion question. He was talking about gay marriage. Um, although he said, uh, he flip-flopped on the abortion thing because he said that like, uh, he thought it was wrong or whatever. He said something like that before he was elected, and then after he was elected, he like totally changed his song type thing. But like, uh, I forget how that went. It's not important for us right now. But Obama gave a good little way of of explaining liberal religion. So he said that the Bible can be used and was used to support slavery in the South. And he said the Bible can be used, and it was used, to support to support abolishing slavery in the North. And he said he, his point of view was that both of these arguments were legitimate and correct. Uh, that they were pro they were both proper interpretations of the Bible, and so therefore the Bible can be used to condemn slavery and support slavery. And so, therefore, you can't believe everything in the Bible. You've got to pick and choose what you think makes sense in it. And so, on, ba on the basis of that, he's willing to say that he doesn't, he, that he doesn't want to, uh, he's okay with gay marriage type thing. Um, I think before, before, though, he said he didn't want to actually make it law. He wanted to just keep keep people with their like uh, what's it called you can have civil unions you didn't have to pass a law or anything to call a marriage and then it was like the Supreme Court made a ruling that decided we have to call it marriage and so then he immediately jumped on board type thing um, I don't you know I'm not gonna try to be mr. Obama expert I'm just using him as a as an example that's liberal religion, and that was born in Germany in the 1800s. That whole idea, and we're, that is very familiar to us. People who like have those parts of the Bible they believe and parts they don't. That's liberal religion. And in, in really liberal English churches, you can have people who call themselves Christians, but not only do they not believe that Jesus actually existed or ever was crucified, so they don't believe they deny the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. They even go so far as to deny the existence of God. They still call themselves Christians because they believe in God as like, God is a good idea. You know, it, it's, a, it's a good story and it's, it's inspirational and we really should follow that. It's, you know, so God, they use the same terminology. Like, they'll talk about the crucifixion of Jesus and God, but they mean that like, it's just like, a, it's a great story. So for them, like, South Park guys are, you know, the, the South Park creators, that's their view. 
that like Jesus is basically real in the sense that Luke Skywalker is real and Papa, you know, and Aladdin and Superman. You know, they're like these are stories and they're real in a sense because they influence you and they they're meaningful to you and important to you, but they're not real in an ontological sense. They're real as a medium of expressing important ideas. So the character's not really real. The character is just like storytelling is a tool for expressing a deeper, more important idea. And so they would say that they believe in it in that sense, that they believe in Jesus the way you believe in Superman or, you know, Batman. You know, there's people out there who, like, are so inspired by these fictional stories that they actually want to emulate and copy these people. And uh, there's some people who take Christianity to that extreme. They're like, they call themselves Christians but they don't actually believe that that God really exists. Um, Robbie Zacharias tells a story of a liberal Church of England preacher. And remember, understand this, uh, in England, the Church of England is the Church of England. It's the government church. It's run by the Queen of England, and you are taxed. It comes out of your taxes. You are taxed to fund this church. This this church is poorly attended, and most who go are like over sixty. And it's largely liberals, liberal, liberal religious people who don't actually believe in God or any of that. And so that they often defend their belief with this like. When you ask them, like, well, do you believe in God or do you believe in the resurrection? With, like, we can't really understand what God re really is and we can't really understand what the resurrection really is and what does the, what are the, what are the definitions of the terms even mean, you know? And so the, they boil it down with, like, long explanations of things that really are just kind of dancing around the real question, you know, is Jesus an actual historical figure? You can say a lot about that without actually addressing it you know so you have to come up with like very precise philosophical terms like in other words is god ontological which means an entity that actually exists an all-powerful all-knowing being that's that's maximally good you know you have to have these very precise terminologies to if you if if you don't have very precise terminologies and a lot of times people can use the vagueness of your terminology like we say, well, do you believe God is really real? They mean they would say, yeah, but they mean it in the sense that like Luke Skywalker is real because people actually try to copy Luke Skywalker. So isn't he real? You know, well, in a sense, there's some reality to him because he affects people's real lives. You know, and it's like they play with that, and uh, that's called obfuscation. When you boil something down with long, long words. You get liberal, you know, liberal religion. So Ravi Zacharias tells a story where a Church of England pastor came out and said that he doesn't believe in the resurrection. But he's going to continue on as a pastor of a church. You know, this is how things go in England, in the Church of England. Not all Church of England churches, or, or, or you can call them Anglican churches, but he, uh, that night, lightning struck the church where he preached that from and went down through the roof and scorched the altar right there where he preached that. And the newspaper, like the next day, with typical British wit, said, if that weren't of God, it ought to have been. <laughs> Type thing. You know, and so that gives you a feel for liberal religion. And a lot of us in America, you know, we might not be in circles where we deal with that, but there certainly are those people. So, like, the guy who wrote The Shack, what's his name? Who, you know, that's that's where we run into it a lot. In America, it's people don't, they don't, they're okay with the resurrection. They're okay with the existence of God, but they don't like the idea of hell. And so you get liberal religious thinking, you know, when it comes to hell. There's an older idea. A lot of people didn't like the idea. I've had people tell me that they're Christians and they, you know, they go to like very conservative Christian churches. But then you talk to them and they're like, yeah, they think 
that believing in actual literal demons or an actual literal devil is stupid. And it's like, it's clear, that, that's clearly in the Bible. Demon, demon possession, demon exorcism, the devil, it's all in there, dude. It's so in there. What are you talk? What are you talking about? You know, but like that's that's liberal religion, you know. And so these German ideas, people have gotten that they're very ingrained and entrenched in our churches. But they're they're super unbiblical. Like they don't come from the Bible at all, you know. And so that's my point that I'm driving at here. So like. Uh, Liberalism is is alive and well in churches, um, and I think the forms you most run into is that whole like everybody goes to heaven thing. But you also run into like there's no literal. I don't believe in a literal devil, and then you go down the line from there. So then you get to like I don't believe in you know Bible stories like part in the Red Sea, Red Sea, and Jonah and the whale, you know, and I don't believe in that. And then you go further down the line, and then you get to, like, you know, that's all a metaphor. And then you get to, like, Jesus, and it's like, well, do you believe in Jesus? And it's like, and so, I mean, there's problems all along the way. It's like, so, like, for example, if they say they believe in Jesus, then it's like, how can Jesus affirmed the reality of the New Testament? So, like, when Jesus, in other words, they asked Jesus, uh, give us a sign and he says no more sign will be given except the sign that was given to the prophet Jonah as Jonah was in the belly of the, of the whale three days so the son of man will be in the belly of the earth three days and so the thing the thing with that is like uh, Jesus didn't say Jonah was symbolically in the belly of the whale he didn't he didn't caveat that. He just explained it as though it was a real thing that happened in, in normal terminology. And so Jesus is affirming, you know, that. And so they run into a problem with that. Um, probably that one of the other major ways you run into it, before you get to people who deny Jesus, you pro I bet you even more common than people who deny miracles in the Old Testament is people who say that the sexual guidelines in the Bible, they just toss those out. You know, so this is liberal religion. This is born out of Germany in the 1800s. Like, uh, as best I understand it, you know, with history, it's always like, seems like there's always more to learn. But like, as best I understand it, Germany in the 1800s pulled these Enlightenment ideas and sort of rebelled against them. And so it's like they're going totally the other way. And so theological rationalism is like, don't believe in anything you can't prove. And the deists are like. We believe in a, you know, this God who just does this, and because this is what we can prove, and uh, they they butted heads. So there's liberal religion, and like I said, there's three basic ideas that I can identify. Uh, one of the other ideas, and this one's really, really important for us to understand today, because this is really influential in our culture, but it's called secularism, and as I understand it, the term secularism was coined by an Englishman by the name of George Holyoke, but the idea goes back to Schleiermacher, who's a German uh, philosopher. And I think it was kind of, he sort of was, maybe gave it the first crystallization, but it was milling around at the time, if I remember correctly. And so, the idea from Schleiermacher was like, Schleiermacher was like, Religion has to do with inner feeling and emotion and inner experience. And it has, religion has, has nothing to do with science and politics. So keep religion out of your science and politics and it's only relevant to inner feeling and, and, and like experience. And so, it's it. The idea of secularism is the idea that there are things in life that have nothing to do with a person's religion. That your religion is irrelevant. And this is actually a big idea, and it has it has a lot of effects on a whole lot of things. So, like, 
there's so many ways in which it affects our lives. So like uh, one of the more prevalent ways I run into is that secular, well, I could give so many examples like to me, this is one of the major reasons people have a hard time like sharing their faith. Although there are other reasons you have a hard time sharing your faith. But before I understood this, I often found it difficult to even find a time to bring up Jesus. And I've had people who like come to me and they're like, I don't know how to bring up God. I don't know how to bring up Jesus. And it, and it feels very awkward to like, you know, bring up God and bring up Jesus. In fact, I think I wrote down, let me see if I can pull this up. I've got like a file on my phone where I wrote some like, uh, let's see, some examples of how secularism makes it awkward to bring up Jesus. And the reason it makes it awkward is because we think that Jesus has nothing to do with anything. Okay, so what are the things that people normally talk about? They talk about their family, they talk about their job, they talk about the news, they talk about the weather. But what if, like, all of a sudden you just said, you know, here, here's a good example. You get on the back of the bus. And then you decide to stand up during the bus ride and you say, I'm glad you could all be with me today. Be here with me today. I would like to tell you about Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, people's eyes are going to roll. They don't want to hear it, you know. Because we have this sense in our culture today where we, secularism is something that's normal in our culture today. And Oz Guinness talks about this other problem called secularization where secularism is growing um, so I, I'll give you a, the way I like to, to illustrate this is secularism is the idea that there's sort of two tables in life and at one table there's like Hindu Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity and atheism and Islam and they're all having a debate about who's right. Secularism is the idea that like let's just leave that table there let that debate continue and it can do its own thing but I'm gonna go over here to this other table and this is the secular table and at the secular table we're going to talk about science and politics and everyday life. And everything we talk about on the secular table has nothing to do with anything on the religious table. It's not the idea that religion is not, can't say anything about science and politics in everyday life. It's the idea that religion is, has nothing to say about those things. So again, this becomes blatantly unbiblical. I mean, like, especially everyday life, you know, like something as simple as riding on the bus or waiting in line for fast food or at a cashier at the gas station. Your religion has nothing to do with that. It, it, it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. So you get the point. Let's, let's, uh. You know, there's so many ways, like I had a friend and he, he liked to go hiking and uh, he went and he said that he went and hiked on the Appalachian Trail, which it, uh, he had gone walking for a lot of it for like a long, long way. And uh, he came off that trail and he said there was a guy there, there were these Christian missionary guys there and like he was so tired and so hungry and as soon as he came off the trail... The guy handed him like a gospel track telling him about Jesus. And he said he wanted to strangle that guy. You know, th this dude that had been hiking, he was a Christian. He was, you know, had led praise and worship, you know, like when I was younger. like And like he didn't flounder in his faith. He's still very much a Christian. He wasn't one of those people that just did that just to like as a, you know, a sort of a lazy way to try to convince himself he's a rock star. You know, he was like a good, you know, like a real deal Christian. And like, uh, he 
He said, it would have expressed love to me ten times more if you just would have given me a pack of crackers or like anything, you know. And so there is this sense in which, you know, we feel like Jesus is irrelevant to the fact that this guy's been walking for a long way and he's tired and he has nothing to do with that. And so we need to find a way to shove Jesus into things where it feels like he doesn't belong. And so we shove Jesus in awkwardly because we actually think that Jesus is irrelevant. So do we think that Jesus is irrelevant to the fact that you're tired? Or we find all kinds of ways, unbiblical ways of shoving him in because we've embraced secularism, even in our churches. So we feel the need to like force Jesus in. Here's a, I got some more, I'll just, I'll see if I can like popcorn these. Uh, so here's one, go out and have fun if you want. I mean, it's your eternal soul, do with it what you want. <laughs> do you have eternal life? Where would you go if you died tonight? So, did you guys see the game last night? Did you see LeBron in that last shot? Uh, no, actually, I was busy reading Ephesians and writing down my testimony. What's your testimony? <laughs> uh, well, I got door-to-door -door evangelism, like literally just going and knocking on doors of random strangers, you know, and just saying, you know, have you heard about Jesus? I think getting outside and coming to a park like this is important. What would you say are the most important things to you in your life? Here's one, uh, just Google Christian Tees and see what you come up with. Awkward ways of shoving Jesus in. You know, it's, it's awkward because we think he's irrelevant. It wouldn't be awkward if it's relevant. So, like, if, like, my video game controller isn't working and then you hand me batteries or you just say, hey, I think it needs batteries, that's not awkward because it's relevant. But if I come in there and say, like, I hand you a glass of milk. That's awkward because it's just irrelevant to anything that's going on, you know. <laughs> All right. So um and a lot of these Christian teas, they they take secular things like uh video games or anything that's going on and you know candy and drinks and then they they Christ, they they put like a Christian facade, they they a Christian twist on it and make it Christian. In like a really corny, cheesy, awkward way. Um, which I don't necessarily have a problem with those shirts. But like they are a great example of how secularized our culture is. Where we have these people who are like strongly devoted to Jesus. But they think that like Jesus is irrelevant to everyday life. You know. Um, here's one. The street preachers, like especially at the colleges, the guy who like calls he calls every girl who walks through a whore, and every guy, you know, I don't know what he calls them. They're they're drunks. I think he calls them all drunks, and it's like, and tells them they need to you know accept Jesus. Um, here's one I, that I, I was I used to. This is 20 years ago. Uh, I used to push groceries but I used to t I used to be a bag boy at a grocery store 20 years ago and I was a Christian back then um and like I would take people's groceries out of the car and load the car some people would want you to do that for them and sometimes they would give you a tip uh, in many situations like little old ladies would literally give me a quarter and I can assure you that that wasn't much money back then I mean Coca-Cola machines that had Cokes for just 50 cents were actually rare back then. Um, they've sort of made a comeback. Um, it's been cool. <laughs> but like, the uh, point is this. I, I loaded the groceries in the car for the lady and then she like had like sort of vanished for a second. And then she walks over there and she just like has like one of those little Gideon pocket Bibles. Which is like a, it's like the size of your wallet, you know, like a man's wallet. And, uh, so it, you know, fits in your pocket pretty well, like a wallet. And she's like, she pulls it out and she, like, wouldn't even look me in the eyes. And she says, here you can, 
here, take this. You can read it and make your decision. And then she just, like, turns around and walks off. And, like, before I have a chance to say anything. And, like, I pull out. I already had a Gideon Bible in my pocket. And I pull out. Hey, I already got one of those. <laughs> yeah. And she wouldn't respond to me. She felt so uncomfortable with the thing. But she felt the need to just, like, that, that, that secularism creates this idea that talking about Jesus is changing the subject. And so, Os Guinness says that secularization, he's a sociologist, I think he's a sociologist, which means he studies social phenomenon, human social life, as scientifically he studies it. And like, uh, secularization is the process by which the secular table is getting bigger and more and more things are in the secular category and that means more and more things have nothing to do with religion and are irrelevant to religion. And then the religious table undergoes privatization where it becomes increasingly smaller. And so the things that are most meaningful to you in your life are becoming increasingly private and you can't share them with other people. Whereas the things that are, you know, whereas the secular part of your life is getting bigger and bigger, and so more and more of your day, you don't think that God has anything to do with, with what you think about, how you feel, you know, whatever you're going through, whatever's on your mind, God is increasingly irrelevant, and so it's like you're an atheist a lot of the time. You know, and so in an extreme example... I'll give you an example. Um, here's a really extreme example. I, we had a, a a young man in the youth group, and he like was new to the youth group, and he went to this thing, which was like sort of a big Christian conference. That its main goal was to share the gospel that Jesus is God, become one of us, died to be punished in our place for our evils, so that we can be forgiven, and then was raised on the third day and if you believe in him then all of this will apply to you and you'll share in his life because you share in his death he's punished for you and now you he lives you live in him so like the point is this kid had like never heard that before and like or I know not to, I don't know if he'd never heard that before but he like on the way back he gotten this like I guess, nasty argument with the youth minister. Um, and I wasn't there. I couldn't, I had to work and I couldn't go to the conference. And like, the youth minister was like, Jesus is the only way to heaven. You have to be forgiven of your sins by Jesus, by Jesus being punished in your place. And that's the only way to go to heaven. And this kid was like, no, it's not the only way. You don't have to believe in Jesus to go to heaven. And they had been arguing about it. And then when I, I there was like a sleepover lock-in thing, and I was able to come to that. And uh, they got back, and they they were immediately like, "You you talk to him." And I was like, I didn't want to I didn't want to tell him what to think. I was kind of amazed because this kid, his dad was a preacher at one of the biggest churches in town. And so I was like, wait, what? You know? And so I, I said to the kid, I said, what does your dad think about all this? You know, it was the first thing I said once they like laid out their disagreement. And I said, what does your dad think about all this? And the kid said something I'll probably never forget. He said, my father doesn't bring his work home with him. That's what he said. So, in other words, his father is a preacher. He His job is to spiritually minister to his congregation at his church, which means he prays with them, he visits them in their time of need and prays with them, he expounds the word of God to them, he teaches them in other environments. Um, those are some of the main things he's going to do, um, among a variety of other things. And so... He, he does those things. But then when he goes home, none of that 
applies to his home life. His home life is irrelevant to his work life. You know, I was talking to a lady one time and she had a son who was, he was struggling with like uh, suicidal thoughts and she didn't know, she was like, didn't know what to do. And I didn't, I didn't know, she was looking for an answer to the question and I was like, I don't really know how to answer this question. Like, what should he do? And all of my answers were like, well, rely on Jesus for this. Remember that Jesus promises this, you know. So, like, if you're upset and despairing about your situation, my first thought is like, you know, Romans 8, 28, something like that. Know that God has a plan for you, and he meant for you to go through this. And therefore, as hard as it is, like, you, you have to have faith that, like, God will look out for you, and that anything that you, you go through that doesn't make sense to you, that it makes sense to God because God's smarter than you, and God meant for you to go through this, and God has a plan for you in this, and your job is to follow and obey God. So, like, all of my thoughts on answering that question were, like, God-based. You know, he's going through a difficult situation, and I would admit, my thoughts went immediately to God. I was like, God will help you, encourage you. God will give you, you know, God tells you things about how to live life. You leave your situation in God's hands, and you focus on obeying and following God. You know, so, like, here's an example, Luke 12. Uh, I've got this one on the wall. It's not It's not as bad of a situation. I don't know if these situations would make someone uh, become suicidal, but maybe. So Luke 12, uh, verse 29, 30, and 31 says, And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. And your father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom, and and these things will be given to you as well. So, like, if you're worried about your life situation, especially, like, things like eating and drinking, he says, no, don't worry. Don't, don't seek, don't even seek those things. God knows you need them. Let God take care of you. But you focus on obeying God and doing the things that God wanted, which might include, you know, going to work, making the money, you know, to pay for those things and getting them but ultimately understanding that you're doing that for God. And if it comes down to a situation where it's like following God is going to cost you, you know, money that you have to have, then you follow God. You know, seek first his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. You know, so I mean, that's an example. So like all of my answers to that lady's question were based on, you know, I, I couldn't think of any answers that didn't, I couldn't answer that question without reference to God. Without God, I just didn't see a way to answer that question. With the, the, the guy was going through hard stuff, her son was going through hard stuff, and I said, so I just, I didn't know if her son was a Christian, you know, he's having suicidal thoughts, and I, so I just said, well, is he a Christian? And she said to me, that doesn't have anything to do with this. I just need to know, does he need a pill? And what kind of pill? So that's a, to me, that's one of the best, best examples of secularism I can possibly, like, you know, that was, she was thinking that, like, in other words, this person was going through a terrible, terrible despair in his personal life. And she had come to believe that God was irrelevant to that. That God had nothing to do with that. And, uh, that's, that's, you know, incredible when you think about it. Um, you know, that God doesn't give you comfort. Like, what is the Bible talking about? He's the God of all comfort. You know? Um, have you read the Psalms? The Psalms go through constantly people who are in terrible, terrible situations who say, you know what, I'm going to trust God anyway and follow God and know that God's looking out for me and God has a plan for me. You know, like, it, it, it just beats it in the ground. Here's some more of these examples. Here's one of the ones, you should come to revival at our church. And then it's like, I remember I was at the barber shop one time getting my hair cut in I don't really, I cut my own hair nowadays, but like, I think like a couple times a year, I'll actually go and 
get a guy to cut my hair. It's like usually like one time a year. And I like remember one time I was in the barbershop and like this older fella comes in there and he like got, I think he didn't even get his hair cut. He just like chit chatted with him and talked about like these guys like to hunt. So he was talking about hunting and stuff and like they were, they were loving talking about that. And then all of a sudden he's just like, well, we're having a revival at so-and-so church and y'all really ought to come. The music's going to be good this year. And they're like, oh, okay, okay. You know, it was very awkward because he just like, he just switched gears and started talking about that. And it was like, you know, it made the whole car, it made all the hanging out and chit-chatting seem almost fake. You know, they're like, so you came in here and we're being buddy-buddy and talking about fun stuff that we like to do. Like you were going to hang out with us and be our friend. But then we find out at the end of the conversation that really you just came in here to invite us to your church. You know, now maybe he really wants them to come to his church and like, you know, it's not, it's not phony like that, but it, it can be. But at the, at the, at, at the very least, it was awkward. You know, even if it's not phony, it's still awkward. Cause it's like, you don't want them to come to your revival because the music's going to be good. You want them to come to your revival because they need Jesus Christ. And because you believe that following God is the most important thing a person can do with his or her life. That's, that's why you want them to come to revival. So, like, it's very awkward to come to someone and say, Hey, you should uh, go to revival. What is revival? What is it? What is it about? It's like sort of like a cult-like thing. Like, oh, yeah, coming to revival at my church or coming to this camp or this D-Now weekend, you know, this is something you should come to. Uh, but you should just come to it even though you have no idea what it's about. And the real reason I want you to come to it is because I want you, I want you to radically refocus your entire life's focus on this God I believe in. Like, it's dis disingenuous to, like, to not, for people to not know that, like, that's what you want them to do. And, like, it just seems to make a whole lot more sense to me to just tell people, hey, these are my beliefs. This is what I believe in. But, like, it's, we, we see a church event like Revival as sort of, we try to use it as a bridge between the secular and the sacred. And it's like the in-between. Going to Revival is like kind of secular, but it's kind of sacred. And it's like, huh? So like, inviting someone to Revival, I just don't, I wouldn't feel morally okay with that unless I had explained to them what the point of Revival is. It just seems like deceitful and dishonest. To invite someone to that, and it, if they don't know what the point of it is, then like, what are they walk? They were not going to know what they're walking into. What is this? I thought it was a, you know, music's going to be good, you know. And so the bottom line is, a lot of times in the culture where I live, everybody knows about Christianity and revival. So that's a little different. If the guy, if you've already talked about it, but like, if you're coming up with someone who's not a Christian. It, Something like that seems like a terrible outreach tool. You know, and from what I've seen, Rodney Stark's uh, sociological research, I, uh, his, one of his more recent books I read, Why God, is that it's not an effective tool. Outreach events are not effective at evangelism, at conversion, for any religion, including Christianity. And what's far, far more effective is personal relationships. That people tend to... Now, Rodney Stark claims that like people convert to a religion when the social... He calls it the social capital within that religious group outweighs the social capital outside that religious group. So in other words, people have this thing called social capital, which just means that like they value their social relationships. Those social relationships are important to them. They make sacrifices of time and money for them, which means that it's actually valuable to them. Just like if you were to go buy a hamburger, you must value that hamburger because you didn't have to go buy it. 
and you gave up money that you could have spent on something else for that hamburger. Well, you make all sorts of expenses for social capital, although that makes it sound kind of selfish. It might not be selfish. It might be that you really value these relationships. You believe in love. You believe in togetherness, trust, and honesty. Well, what Ronnie Stark says is that people tend to convert. Uh, this is a lot of sociological research. Conversions, the, the, the dominant factor in conversions is when person's social capital within the group outweighs the social capital outside the group, and so they convert to that group because that's where their real social ties are. Now, from a Christian perspective, I could say what he's saying isn't all that unreasonable because if, if as, as long as we would caveat and say that people are basing their, their belief, their, their decision on what religion they believe on the, the credibility of the people who are important in their lives. So there's a credibility factor. If that person's important in, in someone that you, you know well and you love them and you trust them and you live with them and you've gotten to know them real well, and if there's enough people like that in your life that like you place a lot of value in and, and you care for a lot and they're important to you and you respect them, then you might be willing to adopt religious beliefs and, fa and, and, and a faith on the basis of their credibility. You know, that the most important factor in religious conversion is when someone has someone like in their life who really believes that thing. And so this would, this would lead to religious groups that like, like the Jains, for example, that require you to be celibate and like never have children and to like cut yourself off from the world, like are probably going to have a real hard time, you know, making converts. Um, so, You get the point. Yeah, so I don't, I don't remember how we got to uh, Rodney Stark's sociological research there. I just read this like book, Why God. Um, he was talking about how we need to... He made an argument that there are no godless religions and that a, a religion without God is no religion at all, which the Jains actually are explicitly atheistic uh, an explicitly atheistic religion so secularism is everywhere and when, another way we see it is that as the secular part of your life is growing the religious part of your life is becoming smaller so like in an extreme case you might think about God and religion, and Jesus, and the Bible, and all of that, you only think about that while you're at church on Sunday. So when you're going to church, you're not thinking about it. You're, you know, Sunday morning before church, you're watching Pokemon, or something like that. And then you're at church, and then you come home and you watch Andy Griffith. You know, and you eat supper with family, and you talk about your week, and you watch Andy Griffith. And so, Pokemon and Andy Griffith are, are good examples of what I'm talking about. Both of those shows always have a moral, a teaching about what the right way to live your life is and what the wrong way to live your life is. And Christianity has a lot of that too. But Andy Griffith and Pokemon are secular. In that they don't really say Christianity's wrong, and they don't say Hinduism's wrong. They don't they don't attack or support any particular religion, but they constantly are filled with like things you know teaching you about how to live your life. So think about how many hours of television you can watch that is filled with moral teachings, the, the secular equivalent, equivalent to biblical commandments. 
You should live like this. Doing this is bad. This is wrong. And it, even it, it's a lot of these shows will even probe deeper into like spiritual questions. Like, look at how this guy went down this road and it it affected him internally, and he became a selfish person or a greedy person or an angry, vengeful person because something he let something that bad that happened to him drive him down this dark road and we're gonna have like this hour long TV show that's gonna delve into that, you know, with these characters and how they're gonna have to respond to that. And it's like, okay. So they're delving into his spiritual issues. They they delve into, you know, the secular equivalent of moral commandments. And as uh Michael Ramsden would say, if they talk about logic then they're delving into the secular equivalent of speaking in tongues. But the thing is, I want you to think about this. Like, think about how many hours in the day we we can go without actually thinking about God. Like, it's actually not that hard, but we can think about morality and commandments and spiritual questions we just call them psychological questions even though psyche literally just means spirit or you know or spiritually focused um and all sorts of stuff and you delve into like questions of origin you start thinking about the big bang and and like the origin of life on this planet and then like you might think about the future and where we're going and so like you can delve into like the basic the big questions how did everything get here what's the purpose of life and like how should I live my life and where is it all going and you can do that without bringing God into it but because of secularism you you don't think you're rejecting God even though you don't bring God into it. Okay. That. That's secularism. And so what happens is. What I, well, this is my personal pet theory. What I think happens is. People start believing in aliens. And the, the reason. One of the reasons people start believing in aliens. Is because they feel like they don't have anything to believe in anymore. Because God has become so contained in that box called the church that they can't believe in God anymore. And so, for me, when it comes to sharing about my religious faith, I have to be careful, you know, because, like, it can always be offensive when you come to someone and tell them that their deeply held personal religious beliefs are wrong. So I tend to do it in a more of a sense of like just sharing what it is I believe. But I have to be more careful about questioning other people's beliefs. But it's usually not that hard to at least share it at least once. You know, at least like this is what I think. You know, because people are always talking one of the th one of the most common things you're going to have conversations with people about is how somebody else is living life wrong or there might be self criticism or you might praise somebody you think's awesome and so it's always moral talk about how to live life we're always talking about morality you know even in politics we're talking about morality and so talking about morality you well you can just you know tell them what you think about it and reference the bible you know well i think this you know and it's just you yeah that's not awkward because again that's like someone who has the video game controller and it's not working and you say well maybe it needs batteries or here are some batteries that's relevant, you know, so like if they say, if they say Donald Trump is a liar and a racist, you might say, you know, if let's say you agree with them on that, then like you might say, well, yeah, you know, the Bible does say thou shalt not lie. You know, that's not so awkward because that's what you believe.
they might they might come back at you and say, well, I don't know if I believe that, but I do believe that lying's wrong, you know. But like you've you've laid out that like, well, this is what I think, you know. Um, is that going to persuade people? You know, so like, for example, if you're trying to push a position on someone and you say, well, the Bible says so, that might not help you push your position if they don't believe the Bible. But that's very different from if you just want to express what it is you believe to people and, you know, that you believe the Bible. So I'll give you an example. I, I'm a skateboarder. I like to skate. And, like, this was years ago. Almost, almost, honestly, it was 10 years ago. And I was skating. And I only had an hour before I had to be at church. It was a Wednesday, so I had, like, youth group. But I had that hour, and I was going to go skate with that hour before I had to go to church. And, I, and like, I, I was out there skating, and, like, these two kids that I know skated. And uh, they had actually rode their skateboards all the way up to the spot. And they were really excited that I was there because they didn't want to have to skate by themselves. And I said... Well, I'm sorry, guys. I got to be at church in an hour, but I'll skate with y'all today for this hour. It was lame because I had, and not even a whole hour because I got to be at church in an hour, you know. So it's gonna take like 15, you know. There goes 15 right there, you know. And like really, they had gotten there like maybe you know a little bit after the hour, you know. But because I had to be at church, and I was an adult that like they listened to me on other things. They thought, well, he must know things about religious questions. And so they came back at me with a question, and they said, apparently these two young men had been having, like, a debate the whole way up there as they had rode their boards and walked. They had been debating uh, religion the whole time. And so I didn't awkwardly shove religion into the conversation, you know, because uh, I did have to be at church, and I wasn't going to be able to skate with them the whole time. But then that opened them up, and they said, can you tell us what Jewicism is? That's what they said, Jewicism. And I said, I think you mean Judaism. And then they were real embarrassed, you know. But, like, it, it wasn't awkward for them to say that either, because, like, you know, I'm someone that, like, they asked me, you know, I was an adult and they were kids. And so kids tend to, like, ask adult stuff. And, like, it wasn't, like, asking me what to believe or what's right. They were just asking me, you know, what do Jews believe? And so I was like, well, Jews are basically this offshoot. And, and, you know, so to understand Jews, you have to understand Christians. And that's kind of the difference. Um, but that that's just an example of, like, it was so simple. I was just, the fact that I was going to church that day created the opportunity for me to share about what I believe, but it wasn't awkward, you know. And so, for me personally, I've kind of gotten over the whole secularism awkwardness thing where that doesn't really bother me, but now I'm much more, I, I still am careful a lot of times because it's it's very like, uh, you your religious beliefs are so important and such a big deal that it's very hard not to come across as arrogant and, and a know-it-all, you know. And maybe in 1850 you could literally be a know-it-all because people didn't know that much. But, like, you want to communicate to people that, like, you sincerely believe this and this isn't just you trying to pontificate as the guy who knows everything, you know. And so it's it's you have to be very careful. So I try to focus what I I try to put something out there and I use a tactic of just like sort of fishing. Like you throw the bait out there and if they take the bait, if they if so like if they say something then I'll sh you know, I'll share something from my religious beliefs. And if they want to talk about that more, I'll talk about it more with them, but like I won't necessarily, you know, go beyond what's relevant to what they said, you know, and start preaching at them. But 
I want people to know what I believe. I want people to know that I'm a Christian. Um, and I'm still learning on this. I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, I've learned that like you spend up telling people about your faith isn't that difficult, but seeing people uh, be converted and come to believe it, that's very different. <laughs> And it seems to take a long time. Um, so there you go. Secularism's huge. Uh, just to finish off secularism, let's, uh, let's see if I got any more. Oh, that was the last one. Yeah, you should come to our revival. The music's going to be good. Okay. Uh, so the last thing on the list, and this one probably won't take very long, is fideism. Fideism also came out of Germany, and this was one of the new things I learned in William Lane Craig's book. Fideism is a big deal. Fideism is the idea that, like, you, your religious beliefs are dictated by, well, you don't have proof. You just believe it. It's the leap of faith thing. You just have to make the leap of faith. And that seems ridiculous, like, why would I believe something if I don't have proof? But it's very common in churches, isn't it? There's all sorts of arguments. People have their own little armies of Bible verses. And one of the, but the primary argument, as I understand it, from the German fideist position, which is where this comes from, was that, like, think about it this way. There's this guy, and he wants to know what religion is true, so he studies philosophy and he studies world religions, and he studies historical evidence, and at the age of 90, he finally commits his life to Jesus Christ. And so there is this question of, like, how does, like, how can a person come to Jesus, you know, without, have, you know, how can a person come to Jesus? And you don't want to be a fideist. You don't want to, like, just believe in something for no reason at all because you run into the problem of, like, how do I know what to believe in? But then if you're a theological rationalist, you say, well, you don't believe in anything without proof. And so then you run into the problem of, well, you know, who has time for that? You know, you're going to be 90. You're going to have to become a professor, you know. Like, these smarty pants guys argue back and forth about this stuff. So, like, can't get in boiled in that, you know. And, and so people try to find some kind of way around it. And so the fideist position becomes popular of, uh, you know, and it might be just based in, I feel good about it and all of my family believes it and my parents believe it. So I believe it. And, but it's a leap of faith. And, and if I had been raised somewhere else, I believe something else. Or if like the, you know, even if, if I was just in a different situation and then, you know, I'd be, you know, so like Michael Ramsden says like this, like you ask most people how they, why they are a Christian and then they answer the question with how they became one, as though that's the answer to why they are one. So it's like, yeah, you know, I met some people, you know, some, and they were, you know, they were, they were all really nice and good people, and they were all Christians, and eventually we start hanging out more and more, and then they, you know, you know, like I met them, you know, I don't know, at the, at the coffee shop, or the cheese shop or, you know, wherever, you know, wherever you eat bagels or whatever it is you do, you know, hanging out there and they're, these, they're nice Christian people and eventually we start hanging out more and more, going to movies, you know, or we, we go out to eat, you know, they come to my house sometimes, eventually they like invite me to church or start going, I like it, you know, and more and more friends there and that becomes more and more part of my life and then eventually, you know, I got converted and I became a Christian. And see, that is not a story about why you are a Christian. That's a story about how it happened that you became one. But that's not really why you are one. That's the story of how it happened. So that's an example of fideism, like how we work through the fideist thing. It's like, yeah, you know, I just felt good about it and liked it, so I just joined up, and it didn't really matter, like the whole, like, I didn't have any proof. So, like, if you were to say to somebody, you know, why do you think it's daytime? 
you know, during the day, then they would just point, they would walk over to a window and point. They wouldn't go through the story of how they met these nice people who believe that it's daytime, you know, and they really enjoyed their company and they started going to the daytime meetings. They would just look at the physical observable evidence. The sun is up. I can see that it's daytime. You know, unless you want to bring in some weird philosophical thing to say that, like, it's all a big illusion. You know, so, like, there is this, this dichotomy because, like, when it comes to religion, the evidence is complicated and hard to understand, and it's like you got to be 100 years old, you know, or 90, before you can become a Christian. And so, it's sort of a either or, and you take one road or the other, and it just doesn't work out, you know, because, like, you can't, you, faith can't just wait to weigh all the evidence and, and arguments back and forth, pro and con, and it just can't, it can't wait forever. You've got to, you know, live your life according to something, and even if you're waiting, you're still living your life according to something. You can't, you know, you've got, you've got a life to live. You, You've got to follow some sort of plan for your life. And it, what, what is it going to be? Well, that's going to be based on what your beliefs are about the origin of all things, the meaning of all things, the, the moral teachings for life, and the, and the ultimate destiny of all things. So you're not, by the time you're 90 years old, I mean, what did you live your life according to at that point? You know, so that, that's a big problem. But on the flip side, you're just a Christian because of a chancy random encounter. Like, what if you had met a bunch of Buddhists and they were really nice to you? You'd be a Buddhist, right? You know? <laughs> so, and you'd, you'd had your coffee and cheese and bagels there with all with the Buddhists, you know? Um, so, there's different ways of resolving this. I'll just tell you my way. I just think that what makes more sense is that well, I've, I've talked about this in a YouTube video. It's called uh, how do you know that, how does the average believer know that God exists? And so my view is this, uh, the book of Romans in the first chapter tells us that creation proves the creator, proves God's existence and what God is like. And so everything in creation is literally everything you've ever encountered, including yourself, everything that exists, your soul, your spirit, every angel, demon, every up and down in, in, the, in the wood from the trees, and the, and the wind that blows in the air, and the sunshine, and the water, and the plants, and then the fruit, and all of it, that's all, cre all that's creation. And so, according to Romans, everything in creation proves God's existence. Well, if, if it's everything in creation, then it's literally everything you've encountered ever, all the time ever. And so, if all of that proves God's existence, then it must be clear that God exists on like an incredible level, it must be blatantly, overwhelmingly obvious that God exists. And so if that's the case, then God's existence is so overwhelmingly obvious, then why... It would probably be difficult to put that, that experience to words. You know, because in life we all the time have experiences that are difficult to put to words. How you feel at any given moment is difficult to put to words. Your experiences are difficult to, you feel like no one ever really understands me, you know. So, that being the case, what you have are Christian apologists or philosophers over the centuries who have taken time to tease out a little bit of the larger proof, and we call these the proofs for God's existence. And they're good proofs, but they're just a part of the larger whole. And so what I would say is that the average person who comes to faith in Christ has this sense that God's real, but they can't put it to words. That's my view. That it's overwhelming. And that it, 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 it's sort of a regressive journey to go back and figure out, like, why exactly did I believe that? But it doesn't mean that you didn't have proof. It just meant that you it was very difficult to explain. Um, so Christian apologetics can help shore that up because a lot of times when you share these arguments for God's existence, people immediately recognize like it seems almost a little bit familiar. Yeah. So anyway, there you have it. 
Germany has had a dramatic influence on religion in the Western world. And now you could say really in China, Africa, and South America, given that it you know, Christianity is exploding there, it's been exported from the West to there, and it is, it's got the chance of becoming bigger there than it is here. So, if it hasn't already. And so that's going, that's all going to be very interesting. Um, but, there's probably been some export of these these cultural things like fideism and liberal religion and secularism, these are sort of Western cultural traditions that have been tacked on to the Bible that aren't really present in the Bible. You know, they're just, they're add-ons. So it's like the Pharisees who had this like really important hand-washing ceremony. And, and you know, Jesus, uh, they confronted Jesus and they're like, why do your disciples not follow the traditions of the elders and wash their hands? Jesus was very upset, and uh, he's like, why do you nullify God's commandments with your man-made traditions? And he talks about how uh, the Bible commands you a, a, a son to take care of his mother and father, but the, the elders teach that if you decide to donate something to the temple, which means to the priest, the priest, then the priests say, well, you don't have to take care of your parents because I donated it to God. And he said, so you nullify, Jesus said, you nullify God's commandment with your man-made traditions. You know, and he, and he just got them more money, too. Yeah, so, like, I think these are man-made traditions that are taught, that are very commonly believed as part of our religious belief. Liberalism, liberal religion, secularism, and fideism are the air we breathe. We're, we're not, they're not ideas that we can sit back and say, hmm, look at that idea, because we're inside them. Like, it's like, uh, Robbie Zacharias talks about it, he says, like, to understand the effect of TV on the culture is incredibly difficult, because we're in it. It's hard to sit back and objectively look at it, because we're so immersed in it. You know, we're inside of it. And so, that's sort of the caveat that makes it difficult. And then here I am talking about it, but it helps to kind of understand how we got to where we are today. You know, and that's a big part of, like, what makes history interesting. And so there we have a bit of history. And uh, if we understand that, I think we can do more to sort of combat it and deal with it. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for your time.